So today we are going to have an introductory lecture, okay, and um, later we are going to be talking about some restrictive lung diseases. Uh, we are going to divide the diseases in restrictive, obstructive, and infectious diseases of the lungs. We are going to study some neoplasia or cancers that appear in the lungs as well. We are going to be studying different sections in this pathophysiology. But we have to start by looking at some signs and symptoms that normally are associated with some pulmonary diseases. Okay. And we have to have clear that these symptoms also can appear in cardiovascular diseases. For example, cough, chest pain, dyspnea. Okay. They can be associated to either cardiovascular, pulmonary diseases, and also sometimes gastro, uh, gastric diseases. Okay. The most common signs and symptoms that appear in people with pulmonary disorders are dyspnea. There are different mm -hmm. definitions of dyspnea and cough. Okay. Other symptoms or signs are hemoptysis, altered breathing patterns. People have alterations in the way they breathe, in the depth, in the rhythm, in the regularity of the respiration. Also hypoventilation, hyperventilation, cyanosis, clubbing and chest pain. Okay. They can be manifestations of pulmonary disorders, disorders, but also remember we have to make a good differential diagnosis to see if they are coming from other uh, <coughs> places. Dyspnea is uh, defined as a subjective experience of breathing discomfort. Okay. It's a subjective thing okay, that is comprised of qualitatively distinct sensations that have different intakes. It's a sensation that the patient can have. Okay, when we observe uh, a patient that has a shortness of breath, that we can say that they have a labored breathing. Okay, but this mea is this subjective sensation. It's an individual <coughs> experience. People are gonna tell you they have shortness of breath differently, and sometimes the degree of this mea doesn't correspond with the severity of the disease. Someone, someone may be having what looks like an important shortness of breath because simply they have a panic attack or they have any emotional problem. Or some people may have really, really uh, low levels of oxygen in the blood and not uh, demonstrate this important dyspnea or labor breathing. It's a very individual experience. Depends on several interactions between some physiologic variables. That is the amount of CO2, the amount of oxygen in the blood, some psychological and also social and environmental factors. Okay, this may induce some secondary or physiologic and behavioral responses. These are different ways of describing a dyspnea. Breathlessness, air hunger, shortness of breath, labor breathing, or preoccupation with breathing. Some people with emotional disorders, for example, with anxiety, etc are like scanning themselves all the time and they are worried <coughs> with their breathing and this leads them to have a certain patterns that we are going to observe in the patients. <coughs> sometimes can be the result of pulmonary disease, sometimes of pain, pain produces uh, emotional imbalances and can produce labor breathing, some heart disease, traumatism and also psychogenic disorders. And this, remember, this doesn't correlate in many cases with the severity of the disease. So we have to do a, a perform a very good physical exam, and we have to uh, draw blood from the patient to assess how the blood gases are in order to actually know how the patient is doing. Sometimes people, for example, can be intubated, or they, uh, are, um, they have these uh, respirators, artificial ventilation, they simply don't develop any kind of shortness of breath or dyspnea or nothing like that, or we don't see that they have any problem because we simply have to assess the respiratory gases in these cases when they are uh, in mechanical ventilation. Well, more severe signs of dyspnea are the flaring of the nostrils and the use of accessory muscles. When people are using accessory muscles and you see these 
flaring of the nostrils or the retraction of the intercostal or supracostal muscles in children, we know that we are in front of a more severe sign. So we suspect that there is more hypoxemia in these cases. <coughs> Remember, the muscles of the respiration are skeletal muscles that get tired very easily. So when we see someone with a labor breathing, we have to have clear that these muscles can get tired and can stop working. So this can lead to a respiratory arrest. In many cases, intubation and giving supplemental oxygen is what is indicated. Dyspnea, dyspnea, of course, can be transient or can become chronic, as many diseases. Okay, there are different ways of calling different types of dyspneas. For example, the one in ex during exercise is called dyspnea on exertion. Orthopnea is the dyspnea that occurs, for example, in heart failure when people lie flat because of the pressure that the abdominal organs are making on the diaphragm. This impairs the effectiveness of the muscles of the respiration and leads to this shortness of breath when they lie down. So what they have to do in many cases is put several pillows in order to prevent this uh, orthopnea. The one that occurs several hours after going to bed <coughs> is called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Okay, this can occur in pulmonary or in cardiac disease. Remember all of the edema that is uh, in the legs, for example, when they are in the horizontal position, starts going back into the circulation. We have a volume overload, and this excess volume starts producing congestion in the lungs, and this uh, fluid leaks into the lung tissue, into the alveoli, producing the shortness of breath at night. Okay, and sometimes it's unrecognized, for example, in mechanically ventilated individuals. You have to be aware of this and follow up these people with uh, blood gases, monitoring uh, the oxygenation of the blood, the oxygen saturation, in order to know how they are really doing. There are different causes okay, of acute and chronic dyspnea. I found this very good table online. Okay, and notice that here we have a uh, relationship between the dyspnea and <coughs> chest pain. Chest pain can be pleuritic, that means that changes with the respiratory movements, okay, worsens with inspiration, for example, or can be non pleuritic, <coughs> so it doesn't change with respiration. Okay, some causes of uh, pleuritic chest pain are pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, asthma, COPD, pneumothorax, and pleural effusion. And then we have here, when there is a non-pleuritic chest pain, we have some acute causes and chronic causes of dyspnea. Acute myocardial infarctions, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism. Notice that these some uh, conditions appear in two lists. Because, for example, pulmonary embolism can produce either a pleuritic or a non-pleuritic chest pain. Okay, they will produce dyspnea, but the pain can be different depending on the patient. Pneumonia, arrhythmias, pneumothorax okay, will produce uh, acute dyspnea and non-pleuritic chest pain. In cases of chronic dyspnea associated with non-pleuritic chest pain, we have angina, Aortic stenosis that also produces angina, the angina that is uh, as a result of anemia, arrhythmias, notice how arrhythmias appear in two lists. Asthma, notice how asthma appears as producing a chronic dyspnea and non pleuritic and sometimes pleuritic chest pain. Okay, that's uh, for you to see that the manifestations. Of the, of the diseases can vary depending on the patient, depending on individual conditions. And we are not going to have always the same clinical presentation for the same disease. And this is simply to have an idea of the different causes of dyspnea, some of them cardiovascular, some of them from the respiratory system and producing other symptoms. Cough is the other uh, very common complaint or presentation of many cardiovascular and pulmonary disorders. Cough, you have to know that simply is a protective reflex 
that allows the body to eliminate uh, mucus, to eliminate debris, to eliminate toxins, bacteria, viruses, okay, to clear the airways by simply producing an explosive in expiration. Yeah, we normally have this mucociliary elevator uh, eliminating constantly all of these mucus, all of these debris and pathogens, but sometimes we can <coughs> inhale excessive amount of pathogens, excessive amounts of different chemicals, um, or, or air pollution, or any kind of uh, particles, and the body needs to produce this cough or explosive expiration in order to clear the airways. Okay, the particles that we inhale, the mucus, inflammatory uh, things or mediators, any foreign body will initiate the cough reflex, stimulating some receptors that we have in the airways, different points. Uh, we, you have to know that, for example, in the distal portions of the respiratory tree, we have very little amount of these receptors. So it is possible that, for example, in the distal bronchi and in the alveoli, we have mm, a lot of secretion and no cough. So normally when what is irritated is the larynx, the trachea, the main bronchi, the secondary bronchi, okay, the more uh, proximal portions of the respiratory tree, it is more likely that we develop an important cough. But when we have this distal uh, or accumulation, for example, of secretions in the distal bronchi and in the alveoli, cough is not going to be present, or at least will not be an important complaint. This explains the cough reflex. Okay, the cough reflex simply starts with inspiration. There is a closure of the glottis and the vocal cords. There is contraction of the expiratory muscles, and then reopening of the glottis, causing this explosive expiration, this sudden and forceful expiration that will remove the offending matter, all of the things that are there. Now, not everybody is able to cough efficiently. Okay? There are people that have neuromuscular disorders, chest wall disorders, <coughs> people who have had strokes, people who have, are very weak or, or have different conditions, people with mental disorders, dementia, etc. people who is very old, for example, don't have this very effective cough reflex, people who just had surgery, and are recovering from the surgery after the anesthesia. Okay, these people don't have a very effective cough reflex, and uh, they are going to be unable to effectively eliminate these secretions, so they are at a greater risk for pneumonia. That's why when you have patients that go to surgery, you have to encourage them to stand up, to walk, to do respiratory exercises, to try to uh, stimulate um, the movements, of course, and uh, stimulate the cough reflex to occur as soon as possible to prevent pneumonias. It was very common in the past to have people, for example, old people with a hip uh, fracture. They had to be in bed for a long time. They would develop a pneumonia and they would die as a consequence of this. Now we have to encourage people to change position, to do deep inspirations, do respiratory exercises in order to prevent these pneumonias. And of course, give them antibiotics, if necessary, to help them prevent the pneumonia. There are different types of cough. There is a table later uh, here to show you some of the causes of acute, subacute, and chronic cough that we have to have in mind when we do our differential. <coughs> we call acute cough that that resolves within <coughs> two or three weeks, either by itself or after treatment, okay, two or three weeks for an acute cough. Then we have the subacute, and we have a time frame from, from three to eight weeks, and a chronic cough that is a persistent cough for more than eight weeks. Okay, normally, um, this acute cough results from upper respiratory tract infections, from rhinitis. Remember when people have rhinitis, they will have a post-nasal dripping and will <coughs> irritate the larynx and will stimulate the cough reflex. So acute bronchitis, pneumonia, congestive heart failure, pulmonary embolism, aspiration of uh, secretions, okay, uh, pharyngeal secretions, gastric secretions, or any kind of secretion 
The chronic cough, which is a persistent cough, remember, for more than eight weeks, normally can be caused depending on if people smoke or not for different things. For example, in non-smokers, the post-nasal dripping syndrome, that some people have a chronic post-nasal drainage, asthma, eosinophilic bronchitis, hypersensitivity of the larynx, the larynx that is more sensitive than in the average people to different kind of stimuli, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or sometimes there is no cough. There are some <coughs> type of psychogenic cough. People who are constantly coughing and coughing to relieve anxiety or, or other uh, psychogenic disorders. It's what we call a nervous cough. In smokers, we have to suspect chronic bronchitis, <coughs> which is the most common cause. But remember, don't forget that this chronic bronchitis one day can become a lung cancer. Or people can develop lung cancer without having any chronic bronchitis first. Okay, so always consider lung cancer as a cause. There is a small portion of people who don't smoke and can develop lung cancer. So don't forget, even in non-smokers, you have to consider lung cancer as the possible cause of a chronic cough. People taking some medications, for example, angiotensin, conversin, converting enzyme inhibitors, may develop cough. When you remove the medication, change the medication, um, and give, for example, an ARBs, angiotensin receptor uh, blocker, you are gonna, uh, well, they're gonna get rid of that cough. It's one of the, of the secondary or adverse effects of these ACE inhibitors. Here you have the table okay, showing you the etiology of the acute, subacute, and chronic cough. As before, some conditions can be in several lists because some of these conditions can go from acute to chronic or can be in the subacute period. Notice that there you have upper respiratory tract infections, for example, the common cold, sinusitis, pertussis pneumonias, pulmonary embolism, and congestive heart failure. Okay, some severe conditions. Remember, these are the don't miss diagnosis of an acute cough. You always have to uh, rule out that people don't have a uh, life-threatening condition like an aspiration of a foreign body, or a pulmonary embolism, or pulmonary edema when you receive your patient with an acute cough. In the subacute, that is the post-infectious uh, period. Some people have a common cold, some people have the flu. They are coughing for a couple of, of weeks. Sometimes they get better. They are symptom-free. They are okay, but the cough can persist for a certain time. So we call this a subacute cough. Also the post-nasal trip after the cold. Pertussis can extend beyond the three weeks. Tuberculosis can produce uh, notice that tuberculosis is in the subacute and in the chronic lists. Okay, sometimes you detect <coughs> people when they have tuberculosis, you start giving the medication, the cough gets better. So we classify this as subacute. Some people develop a chronic persistent tuberculosis that is active for a longer time and they can have a chronic cough. Also depends on the immune system of the person, okay, the response to the medications. Some mycoplasma and chlamydia infections of the lungs okay, are going to produce a subacute cough. We are going to study these conditions when we study infectious diseases of the lungs. And chronic cough can appear in people with asthma, COPD. Okay, we are going to study COPD actually is two diseases in one, emphysema or chronic bronchitis. Sometimes there can be an overlap. We are going to see how to differentiate which patients have emphysema, which patients have uh, chronic bronchitis. Cancer appears here. Eosinophilic bronchitis is simply a bronchitis that is produced by accumulation of eosinophils in the bronchial mucosa as a result of an allergic process. Esophageal disease is chronic gastric reflux of acid. The acid will irritate the larynx and produce a chronic <coughs> cough. Sometimes the acid can even enter into the respiratory tree and can damage and can burn the bronchi 
and even distal portions of the respiratory tree. There you have, again, the post nasal drip, which can be very chronic in some people. And simply giving uh, some antihistamines, we can help people to get rid of these uh, post nasal drip, and the cough gets better. AC inhibitors, smoking, <coughs> will produce a ACE inhibitors doesn't mean CV. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as you know from previous studies, this is simply the coughing of, of blood. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes can be confused with hematemesis. Someone is coughing blood and Sometimes you don't know, is this coming from the respiratory, <coughs> is this coming from the lungs, is this coming from the stomach? So we have to try to, at least clinically, or doing certain tests to differentiate. For example, blood that is produced uh, with coughing, hemoptysis, usually is bright red, hasn't been, been digested, hasn't been in contact with gastric acid, normally has an alkaline pH, and is mixed with the frothy sputum, so you see bubbles, you see sputum, you see like foam with this blood. The hematemesis tends to be darker because has been previously digested and mixed with the acid in the stomach. Unless this is a, there is a lot of blood coming uh, from, for example, people who have a, um, esophageal varices and these varices are bleeding, or people who have a very important gastrointestinal bleeding that will vomit uh, red blood. But normally, hematemesis tends to be darker. This uh, fluid has a more acidic pH. And normally, will be mixed with food particles. These are things that we can use to differentiate hemoptysis from hematemesis. Hemoptysis normally means that some blood vessels in the respiratory airways have been broken for different reasons, okay? For because of infection, because of inflammation, for example, bronchitis, bronchiectasis, which are dilations, permanent dilatations of the bronchi, or sometimes because of pneumonia, tuberculosis, abscesses in the lungs, the different causes. And also you shouldn't forget that cancers, infarctions, or a very rare condition that is pulmonary vein stenosis will lead to also hemoptysis. And these are different causes that we are going to be studying during this uh, pulmonology section and are the more frequent causes of hemoptysis. There you have these uh, a little bit more organized in infectious uh, conditions, cardiovascular conditions, tumors, or other causes that can produce hemoptysis. Okay, there you have some infections, there you have bronchiectasis, different types of lung cancer, the cardiovascular <coughs> conditions that can produce hemoptysis, lung infarct and mitral stenosis. Okay, this increase, remember when you have a mitral stenosis, there will be increased <coughs> left atrial pressure that will be, will produce congestion in the pulmonary circulation, and this sometimes can damage the blood vessels of the lungs and can produce hemoptysis. So don't forget the cardiovascular conditions that produce hemoptysis. Because we tend to think, OK, this is blood from the lung. This is a lung problem. And we forget about the relationships uh, with other uh, systems. Traumatisms, uh, foreign bodies, problems with uh, uh, the coagulation of the blood, and some syndromes that we are going to study in rheumatology, like good pasture and other autoimmune or immunological conditions that we're going to study in the future. Also, we have to know something about the abnormal breathing patterns that we can find in our patients. Okay, there you have what is considered normal for our breathing patterns, eupnea, or sometimes normopnea. Okay, is simply a rhythmic and effortless breathing with a respiratory rate of about 8 to 16 per minute, tidal volumes that vary depending on the people, depending on the situation, from 400 to 800 milliliters. Okay, normally after expiration, there has to be a little pause, okay, short expiratory pause after each breath. And people 
normally can take occasional deeper breaths. Okay, remember our uh, hypothalamus is, norm is trying to maintain a constant concentration of oxygen and CO2 in the blood. So if our normal respiratory rate and tidal volume uh, doesn't satisfy these demands, once in a while there will be a signal from the hypothalamus to the respiratory muscles. So we take a deeper breath and we take the values to normal again. Okay? Side breaths normally help, help to maintain the normal lung function. These are completely, no completely normal. The uh, depth of the respiration is 1.5 to 2 okay, times the normal tidal volume. So if someone has a tidal volume of 500 ml, they can have these deeper breaths of 750 okay, or uh, 1 liter of air per day. 1.5 to 2 times the tidal volume. And can occur normally okay, from 10 to 12 times per hour. Okay, so if you see someone that is taking deep breaths 10 to 12 times per hour, that's normal. If you see someone that is having more like this, this can represent anxiety, this can represent these psychogenic uh, disorders or this preoccupation with breathing that some people can have due to these emotional problems. And remember, this is our body trying to maintain homeostasis, so the depth, regularity of the respiration will be changed depending on what we are doing, if we are walking, if we are running, if we are in different conditions, physiological or pathophysiological, the patterns of, will adjust to minimize the work of the respiratory muscles. It's a very efficient mechanism because remember the respiratory muscles can get tired and respiratory arrest can occur. We're going to mention some abnormal breathing patterns. Okay, for example, strenuous exercise or sometimes uh, <coughs> different cases of metabolic acidosis as it happens with people with decompensated diabetes mellitus can have a respiration that is called Kussmaul respiration or hyperplia. Okay, normally there is an increased ventilatory rate and a very large tidal volume without any expiratory pause. So if this is the normal tidal volume, there is an expiratory pause. Okay, this will be very large tidal volume with no expiratory pause. Okay. Later there is a diagram for you to have it there. Labor breathing occurs normally when people have an increased work of breathing, for example, when there is obstruction to the airways. Obstruction to the airways can be proximal or can be distal. Proximal obstruction to the airways can be produced by a tumor, can be produced by foreign bodies. Of course, you're going to differentiate this because one occurs very ac acutely, suddenly, and the other occurs more slowly, more gradually. If it's a tumor <coughs> that grows slowly. <coughs> But you can have distal obstruction of the airways as it happens in chronic obstructive pulmonary <coughs> disease, as it happens in asthma, because of the constriction of the bronchioles, or because of the accumulation of mucus plugs in distal areas. So these people will have a labored breathing with different patterns depending on if the obstruction is proximal or distal, but we are not going to enter in those differences. <coughs> Restricted breathing can be produced by anything that compresses the lungs, or the rib cage, any, any <coughs> neuromuscular disorder, any deformity of the thoracic cage, okay, uh, will produce a restricti restrictive breathing pattern, something that stiffens the lung tissue as pulmonary fibrosis. Some people have chronic inflammation of the lungs and scarring of the lung tissue, or simply deposition of collagen and connective tissue in the lung tissue. This will produce a stiffening of the lungs or any decreased compliance, any problem of the chest wall, and they will have small tidal volumes and a rapid ventilatory rate. If we can't expand the lungs well, the tidal volume is going to be very slow, and so we need to breathe faster in order to maintain the normal concentration of oxygen in the blood. People who are in shock or people who have severe cerebral hypoxia Okay, they will have a respiration that is like gasping, 
gasping respirations that are irregular, quick inspirations with expiratory pause. Anxiety can cause these sighing respirations, <coughs> these respirations that are irregular as well and have frequent deep sighing inspirations. Not the normal 10 to 12 times per hour that can happen in normal or physiologically. These are going to be more frequent. There is a kind of respiration that is called chain stokes, which are, which are alternating periods of deep and shallow breathing, okay, sometimes deep, sometimes shallow, with an apnea period that lasts from 15 to 60 seconds, followed by ventilations that increase in volume until a peak is reached. It is better to understand it when you see the diagram than just reading there. Then the ventilation, the tidal volume, will decrease again, going to apnea. A period that can be up to one minute without respiration, then starts increasing, increasing, increasing the tidal volume, reaches a peak, and then goes down, 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 until apnea develops for 15 to 60 seconds. This can result from any condition that reduces the blood flow to the brain stem. Okay, any interruption of the circulation to the brain stem that slows impulses that send the information to respiratory centers. Any other problem above the brain stem can also contribute to this chain stop respiration. And there you have the diagrams, okay? There you have the diagrams. The one on top is the normal respiration. The second is one that is called Biot's respiration or ataxic respiration. It's a very irregular respiration with periods of apnea. Okay, and this one represents when there is a neuronal damage and has a very poor prognosis. Okay, for example, some people in coma because of strokes, because of uh, increased intracranial pressure can, can present with this irregular or ataxic respiration. This is the Kuzmaul breathing which is simply hypermia, very high tidal volume without any expiratory pause. That normally occurs in metabolic acidosis. And there you have, like a mnemonic, there is Kuzmaul, in which you have several causes of this Kuzmaul respiration. With the K, you have ketones, ketonemia, diabetic ketoacidosis. With the U, you have uremia, people with chronic kidney disease, and elevated levels of these waste products in the blood. With the S, you have sepsis and salicylates, aspirin overdose, um, any sepsis, septic problem. With the M, you have methanol, which is a poisonous type of alcohol. With the A, you have aldehyde. So this kind of poisonings with aldehydes, with methanol, can produce metabolic acidosis and Kussmaul <coughs> respiration. There is another EU that doesn't have anything. And the L, lactic acid acidosis, or lactic acidosis. And down here, you have the chain stops respiration. Notice how you have apnea, then you have a tidal volume that increases, increases, increases reaches a peak and then decreases, decreases, decreases gradually until a new apnea period is developed. Okay? This can be produced by any kind of hypoperfusion to the brain stem, to the respiratory centers. Okay, but also because of hypoxemia, drugs, etc. We can have these different types. So different types of breathing patterns. And let's have a break for 10 minutes. Hypoventilation, hyperventilation are other two things that can appear in people with pulmonary disorders. Hypoventilation simply means not adequate alveolar ventilation in relationship to the metabolic demands. 
remember, we ventilate the alveoli depending on what we need. If we are sleeping or we are resting, we don't need too much oxygen. If we are running, we are exercising, or our metabolic rate is very high, we need to get more oxygen, so we need a higher ventilation. So when this is inadequate, okay, we receive less oxygen uh, in relation to our metabolic demands, we call this hypoventilation. And this occurs normally when what we call the minute volume, which is the tidal volume plus the respiratory rate is reduced. And this is the way we calculate what we call the minute volume, which is the amount uh, of air that enters per minute in our alveoli to be able to exchange gases. This can be caused by different pulmonary uh, alterations, alterations in the pulmonary mechanics, or in the neurologic control of the breathing. Okay, the CO2 removal doesn't keep up with the CO2 production, so the pressure, partial pressure of CO2 in blood increases, producing hypercapnia, which is defined by the partial pressure of CO2 greater than 44. What happens when we have CO2 accumulated, this results in, meta in respiratory acidosis, that, remember, acidosis of any, of any cause can affect the functions of many tissues. Hypoventilation is a problem that sometimes is overlooked until it's very severe. It's very easy to recognize when someone is hyperventilating or when someone has labored breathing or respiratory distress. But when someone is hypoventilating, that is very difficult. How are you gonna, even, uh, for example, uh, my dog was, uh, had surgery recently. <laughs> and I had to wake up in the middle of the night to see if she was breathing. I had to Aww. and touch her. And you sometimes wake her up and she, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Because you don't know if someone is hypoventilating or simply has a very, very slow respiratory rate. Okay, it's, it's difficult to recover. Yeah. So, uh, sometimes a ventilatory rate may appear normal, and the changes in tidal volume are very difficult to detect. And what we have to do is simply arterial blood gases in order to know how is it going. Okay. When there is a very important hypoventilation, this will produce hypoxemia, sometimes will, will be manifested with somnolence or disorientation. Yeah, I remember arterial blood gases are the ones who are gonna give us the last uh, result. Now hyperventilation is the contrary, okay, when the ventilation exceeds the metabolic demands. Okay, now this, the lungs are gonna remove CO2 faster. If we eliminate CO2, we are gonna develop hypocapnia, low partial pressure of CO2, below 36 millimeters of mercury, and this will produce a respiratory alkalosis that also will interfere with the tissue functions. Okay, this will occur with anxiety, head injury, with pain, and also in response to anything that causes hypoxemia. Okay, we have low levels of oxygen, we tend to uh, breathe faster, and we can develop these uh, hyperventilation and reverse the process. Now, cyanosis is another uh, sign. It's a sign that can appear in people with respiratory problems and also cardiovascular problems, as you studied uh, before in some congenital malformations. So it's a bluish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes that normally is caused by increasing amounts of desaturated or reduced hemoglobin. Okay? This end when someone has cyanosis, doesn't mean that they have low level of oxygen. Simply they have higher than normal amount of desaturated or reduced hemoglobin. Okay, so cyanosis is a sign that has to be analyzed in the relationship with other factors. Okay, cyanosis by itself doesn't say anything. And absence of cyanosis also doesn't say that the person is doing okay. Okay, so we have to analyze different things. Cyanosis can be peripheral <coughs> or central. Peripheral is the one that we see only in the hands and feet, sometimes in the ears, when people are exposed to cold, for example, or when people have peripheral artery disease, obstruction of the arteries, it can produce peripheral cyanosis, right nut phenomenon, for example, 
simply because there is a slow blood circulation in the extremities, in the fingers and in the toes, circulatory problems, peripheral vasoconstriction, for example, in people who have Raynaud, cold, uh, or severe stress. Normally, this is better seen in the nails uh, of the beds. Central cyanosis normally is caused by a decreased arterial oxygenation, low pressure of oxygen from pulmonary uh, diseases or cardiac right to left shunt. Remember Eisenmenger syndrome and all the, uh, the pathologies that we studied, the congenital malformations that can produce cyanosis. Normally, this is detected in the mucous membranes buccal mucous membranes and in the lips. Remember that lack of cyanosis doesn't mean that the oxygenation is normal. Okay? Uh, in adults, cyanosis normally is not evident until a severe hypoxemia is present I, and it's an insensitive indication of respiratory failure. We can't wait until people develop cyanosis. In people who have severe anemia, and people who have carbon monoxide poisoning, people can have very low levels of oxygen in the blood without developing cyanosis. For cyanosis to develop, what has to happen is that at least five grams of hemoglobin get desaturated. Okay, so if the hemoglobin doesn't get desaturated, but instead, instead starts binding to something else like carbon monoxide, we are not going to see the cyanosis. Okay, people with anemia have very low levels of hemoglobin. Okay, but all of it can be saturated. So even though they have low levels of oxygen because of the low amount of hemoglobin, <coughs> we don't see the cyanosis because we have to wait for this, for the cyanosis to appear. So severe anemia and people with carbon monoxide poisoning can have very low levels of oxygen and normal skin coloration, or at least not, don't develop cyanosis. Also, uh, you have to know that people with polycythemia, which is the contrary of anemia, very high amount of red blood cells, very high concentration of hemoglobin, they can develop cyanosis and have normal levels of oxygen. Okay, they have a lot of hemoglobin. If five grams of it get desaturated, they will develop a bluish discoloration but their oxygenation is normal, so we don't have to do anything except the normal treatment for polycythemia. Okay, we don't have to do anything about their cyanosis. They have, they have this very uh, red and bluish coloration sometimes that looks like cyanosis, but it's simply a normal manifestation of the pathologic condition. These are some mnemonics that we can use for cyanosis, peripheral and central, cold palms. Okay, peripheral cyanosis, cold obstruction of the arteries. Okay, peripheral artery disease. Left ventricular failure and shock can produce peripheral cyanosis because of the increased vasoconstriction in the extremities, decreased cardiac output that happens in shock as well. Central cyanosis in polycythemia, high altitude, lung diseases, methemoglobinemia and sulfhemoglobinemia. Simply, for example, people um, who take some sulfonamides, this, this is not very frequent, but uh, sulfonamides can bind to hemoglobin and produce sulfhemoglobinemia. <coughs> These are very rare uh, findings. Okay, uh, anesthetics, for example, can produce what is called methemoglobinemia, and people after surgery or during surgery can develop uh, cyanosis as a result of the binding of hemoglobin to these chemicals. And shunts, any kind of right to left shunt, okay, as it happens in these congenital malformations, will produce central cyanosis. <coughs> clubbing, well, clubbing is simply a selective bulbous enlargement of the distal segment of the fingers or the toes. It's a painless condition usually, and it's associated with anything that produces chronic hypoxemia. 
Okay, so when you see clubbing, we have a lot of work up to do, trying to find out what is the cause. For example, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, fibrosis of the lungs, abscesses in the lungs, congenital heart conditions. Clubbing is rarely reversible. Okay, so you can treat the disease, people can get better, but the clubbing is gonna stay there. Why people develop clubbing? Well, the mechanism says, remember normally we don't have megakaryocytes in the circulation. We have platelets which, which are little pieces of megakaryocytes which are there for, uh, to produce the coagulation of the blood. But in these people, all megakaryocytes enter the systemic circulation from the bone marrow <coughs> and get impacted in the fingertip circulation. There they become activated, they start releasing uh, chemicals which are called platelet-derived growth factor. This chemical starts promoting growth, increases the vascular permeability, attracts monocytes and neutrophils, and leads to an increased number of vascular smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts that accumulate under the nails, producing this clubbing and increases the, the size of the tips of the finger. This can be seen, for example, in people with lung cancer, even without hypoxemia, because lung cancer cells will produce some inflammatory cytokines that will produce these deformities that we know as clubbing, something that we call hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. When you have a patient with clubbing, always, if there is no other cause, always look for a cancer. Again, we have a mnemonic here. Uh, this mnemonic is a little bit, uh, has two L's and only one B. There is a clubbing that is like misspelled. <laughs> okay, some cardiovascular conditions, any congenital heart disease, endocarditis, Eisenmenger syndrome, shunt, lung diseases like abscess, bronchiectasis, cancer, cystic fibrosis, chronic bronchitis, okay, fibrosis of, of the lungs. Some liver conditions like Hepatitis and cirrhosis can produce clubbing, ulcerative colitis, okay? This is exactly for the same reason that cancers produce uh, clubbing, okay? Ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammatory condition. These inflammatory cytokines will produce this osteoarthropathy. Uh, intestinal conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, chronic inflammation, again, okay, celiac disease, we have lymphomas, carcinomas. Okay. You can say <laughs> celiac disease. <laughs> <laughs> Lymphoma cancers, some uh, parasitic conditions. What is that? Clubbing can be idiopathic. <coughs> it's not normal, but it's idiopathic. We simply don't know what's going on. We put normal there to put something. Genetic conditions, okay. Hypertrophic. Uh, Osteoarthropathy and some acromegalic fissures uh, in this syndrome, pachydermopediostitis, that I'm sure you're never gonna see. <laughs> it's just there to put something in the G of clubbing. Other things that do, don't enter into the mnemonic are thyroid problems, thyrotoxicosis, and occupational jackhammer operators can develop because of the traumatisms Inflammation, chronic traumatisms in the fingers can develop clubbing. Okay, so look how many things to rule out and how many things in our differential when someone has clubbing. This is uh, something very important, okay? COPD, people with COPD can have clubbing if they have chronic bronchitis. If they have <coughs> emphysema, they are not very likely to have clubbing. When we have a patient, okay, that has emphysema and clubbing, we have to look for something. Lung cancer or bronchiectasis, which are dilatations of the bronchi. It, it, there says it is not found in pure emphysema because as we are gonna study in the future, uh, COPD can be emphysema, can be chronic bronchitis or can be a mixture. Sometimes there is an overlap between the fissures of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. There is a mixture or overlap. 
and in pure emphysema we don't see clubbing. Well, pain is another uh, thing that can appear in people with pulmonary disorders. When people have chest pain, we have to look at many different reasons, cardiovascular, pulmonary, neuromuscular, okay, mechanical, chest wall problems. Pain can be produced by diseases that originate in the pleura, in the airways, or simply in the chest wall. Okay, for example, infection and inflammation of the pleura will produce a sharp or stabbing pain called pleurodynia that occurs when the pleura stretches during inspiration. Okay, normally this pain is localized to the portion of the chest wall where there is a friction because of the loss of the smoothness of these layers of the pleura. And if you auscultate, of course, you are going to hear this uh, friction rub. This pleural pain will be made worse with laughing, with coughing, sometimes walking will make it worse. This can occur, for example, with pulmonary infarction because of the necrosis, because of the death of the tissue, pulmonary embolism, and originates in the area around the infarction because of the release of inflammatory cytokines. If the infection or inflammation is in the trachea or in the main bronchi, which is called tracheitis or tracheobronchitis, it will produce a more central chest pain, and sometimes it's difficult to differentiate from cardiac chest pain. We have to rule out cardiac problems. And normally, this central chest pain will be worse after coughing. Okay? Pulmonary hypertension <coughs> can cause pain during exercise and can be confused with angina pectoris. So we have to, you have this uh, angina type of pain after exertion. We have to rule out also pulmonary hypertension. If we see that the electrocardiographic findings don't reveal any cardiac ischemia, we have to suspect pulmonary hypertension. Now, the pain can be in the chest wall. For example, muscle pain, rib pain, because of traumatism, because of exercise, because of chronic cough that produces soreness in the muscles, rib fractures, cardi uh, sorry, thoracic surgery will produce pain in the chest wall. How do we know that the pain is originating from the chest wall? Because compression will reproduce the symptoms. There is a very common condition that is called costochondritis, which is simply the inflammation of the joints uh, of the ribs with the sternum. With the sternum, if you compress these joints, the pain is going to be reproduced. Movements will also reproduce the pain. So chest wall pain normally can be reproduced by pressing on these joints, pressing on the sternum, pressing on the ribs. These are some common causes of chest pain. And then you have the cardiac ones. And we have studied for coronary artery disease, valvular diseases, pulmonary hypertension, mitral valve prolapse, pericarditis, stenosis, subaortic stenosis, pulmonary causes, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, pleuritis, pneumothorax. Emotional problems will produce chest pain as well, depression, anxiety the section of the aorta, herpes zoster, don't forget to, whenever anyone has chest pain, remove your shirt, look at the back of the patient, okay? This can be herpes zoster, postochondritis, arthritis, muscle spasm, bone tumors as well, and some gastrointestinal conditions, like ulcers, bowel diseases, hiatal hernia, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, can also produce pain that radiates to the chest or pain that originates, or patient thinks that they originate in the chest. Gastritis, ulcers, sometimes tend to produce a pain that is very difficult to differentiate from, um, from cardiac pain. Gastroesophageal reflux disease as well. But this has a very small letters. <laughs> But you can uh, look at this later at home. Okay, there you have something that you can use for your differential, for your OSCEs, for your practice. 
okay? Description of the pain, onset of the pain, location, other signs and symptoms, relief of the pain. Okay, you can use the mnemonic dolor in order to remember this. <coughs> and then you have the cardiac, then you have the pleuritic, you have the traumatic pain. Notice how the description of the pain in the cardiac is heavy, tight, squeezing, dull. In the pleuritic and traumatic it tends to be stabbing, sharp pain. The cardiac pain is gradual in angina, stable angina. But can be sudden in unstable angina and myocardial infarction. Okay? If it occurs with exercise, angina. If it occurs at rest, unstable angina and myocardial infarction. The pleuritic pain, in the cases of infections, it can be gradual, but if it's a pneumothorax, it will be a sudden pain, very, very severe sometimes. The traumatic can be gradual, can be sudden, depending on the severity of the traumatism. Now, what about the location? Uh, the cardiac pain is, uh, we can have the classic location of the myocardial infarction that we know. But it's a poorly localized pain. It's like a pressure or a sensation in the middle of the chest. Remember, it can be painless as well. It can radiate to the back, can radiate to the jaw, can radiate to the left arm. Rarely changes with palpation or with position or with cough or with laughing, etc. The pleuritic pain is well localized, chest wall, and changes with palpation and with ventilatory movement. Inspiration worsens it. The same happens with traumatic pain, well defined. Okay, just wall changes with palpation and with ventilation. Other signs, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, palpitations in cardiac pain, shortness of breath on exertion in the pleuritic pain, Shortness of breath and exertion in the traumatic pain. Relief, well, normally cardiac pain is relieved with nitrates in angina and unrelieved with nitrates in unstable angina and infarct. Poorly relieved with NSAIDs, poorly relieved with change in position. So ibuprofen is not going to make it better. Now the pleuritic. And the traumatic pain are unrelieved with nitrates. That is a mild relief with ibuprofen in both cases, or NSAIDs of any type. And there is some relief with change in positions. You can have a guide okay, in the way to recognize different types of pain. depends on the degree of the obstruction, on the amount of time that the obstruction is present. Okay, okay the first thing that we are going to uh, cover in hormonology the restrictive lung diseases. Okay, we are going to be talking about some pulmonary conditions that produce a restrictive pattern in the pulmonary function tests, which are aspiration of fluids, aspiration of foreign bodies, atelectasis, pulmonary fibrosis, inhalation of different things, pneumoconiosis, allergic alveolitis, pulmonary edema, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
in future lectures, we are going to be studying the obstructive diseases. We are going to be studying um, infectious diseases and cancers of the lungs. Remember, it's important to review the anatomy of the lungs. And it's important to review the normal uh, physiology and the volumes and capacities of the lungs, what is tidal volume, what is inspiratory reserve volume, what is expiratory reserve volume, and what is the residual volume. Don't forget, we don't measure this in the pulmonary function tests. Okay, we only can measure what is called the vital capacity, which is adding all these three. Okay? And the total lung capacity, we can know it unless we know the reserve or the residual value. Okay? This is what we measure normally. Also remember that there are tests that we do to determine if someone has a restrictive or obstructive uh, pattern. And that is measuring the forced vital capacity in one second. Okay? The forced expiratory value in one second and dividing it by the forced vital capacity. Important to know the difference between obstructive and restrictive diseases. A restrictive disease is that in which the compliance of the lungs are reduced, so they don't expand. Remember, compliance is the capacity for expansion. Okay? <coughs> this occurs when there is, a, for example, increased stiffness on the lungs, and limited expansion. Normally, these people require a greater pressure okay, to have the same increase in volume. If we normally have an X pressure to obtain an X volume. These people require a greater pressure in order to obtain the same volume. They need a greater respiratory effort. We're going to study some causes of decreased lung compliance, like pulmonary fibrosis, pneumonia, that remember produces a consolidation of the lung tissue, and pulmonary edema. Obstructive diseases is when there is an obstruction that causes an increase in resistance to the expiration. When the air tries to go out, there is an increased resistance, so there is trapping of air. When these people breathe normally, the relationship between the volume and the resistance is not very different from a normal lung. But when there is rapid breathing, they need greater pressure to overcome the resistance flow. Okay. And the volume of each breath gets smaller. And we are going to study some diseases like asthma, bronchitis, and emphysema. How do we distinguish between obstructive and restrictive diseases? Well, we have to do the pulmonary function tests, in which we obtain certain values, like force vital capacity and the force expiratory volume in one second, okay, in the first second, that allow to clearly distinguish between these two diseases. Okay, we are going to compare later what how it looks like in the obstructed and in the restricted lung. The force vital capacity, mm -hmm. 
important to distinguish um, between the two conditions. Okay, in obstructive uh, lung disease, we are going to see that the force vital capacity, the amount of air that people can forcefully, forcefully exhale, is going to be smaller than normal. But also, they are going to have a force expiratory volume in one second that is much smaller than normal. Okay? Smaller force vital capacity, but they are much smaller than normal FEV1. That is going to make the ratio okay, of these uh, two values to be a lot lower than normal. For example, 40% as opposed to 80% as it happens in normal people. This occurs because this is very difficult for a person with obstructive disease to exhale quickly because of the increase in the airway resistance. In restricted lung, the force vital capacity is smaller than normal, but the FEV1 is not as, as smaller as in people with obstructive diseases. So the ratio between the two values can be normal or even higher than normal. For example, instead of 80, it can be 90. Okay, normally, this occurs because this is easy for a person with a restricted lung to breathe out quickly. They have difficulty inhaling, but they don't have any difficulty exhaling. The problem with obstructed lungs is in exhalation or expiration, and the problem with the restricted lung is in inspiration, and they don't have any problem with expiration. There you have diagrams that show this. Okay, there you have on the left what happens in obstructive lung disease, and on the right what happens in restrictive <coughs> lung disease. This is the normal lung, and this is what happens in the obstructed lung. They have a decreased uh, expiratory reserve volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and vital capacity, but they have an increased residual volume. That's why they have this air trapping and this expansion of the chest, and they develop this barrel chest. In the case of, in the case of the restrictive lung disease, notice how all of the values are low. They have low force vital capacity, low vital capacity, low residual volume, low total lung capacity. The total lung capacity is increased in the obstructive disease. When you compare the curve of the volume and time, notice how in the obstructive disease there is a reduced force vital capacity compared to normal, but there is a very, very reduced FEV1. Compare this with the restrictive <coughs> disease. They also have reduced force vital capacity. But the FEV1 doesn't go down as much as it is in uh, obstructive disease. That's why the ratio between these two is what will give us the difference between the restrictive and obstructive pattern. There is a very, very low ratio because the, new, the denominator FEV1 is very high in the obstructive pattern compared to the numerator, that is the FEV1. In the restrictive disease, this ratio can be normal, 80%, or sometimes higher than normal. can be above normal. And then you have this uh, table that compares the obstructive with the restrictive pattern. Okay, FEV1 will be decreased below 80% of the predicted. And it's important to say of the predicted because when you take these values, you have to compare the value of the specific patient with the values of other people of their same, same age, sex, and race. It will be different depending on the age, depending on the sex, depending on the race. Decrease FEV1, decrease out of proportion to the FBC to the force vital capacity out of proportion a lot more than the FBC. In the case of restrictive, maybe preserved, but if it's decreased, it's in proportion to the FBC. 
okay, both decrease a little bit proportionally. The force vital capacity is decreased, sometimes may be, may be preserved. Now the force vital capacity is less than 80% of the predicted, always decreased. The ratio is below 0.7, can be a lot smaller as 0.4. In the case of the restrictive pattern, this can be normal or even increased to 90%, 0.9. The total lung capacity will be elevated. Remember the air trapping in the obstructive disease. The total lung capacity, all of the volumes and capacities are decreased in the restrictive pattern. Then we have the diffusion, the, the, the diffusive capacity for carbon monoxide, which is a test that we do to, to see how much a gas exchange is occurring. Okay, this will be normal in the obstructive disease, for example, in asthma. <laughs> Only if people have emphysema, the diffusing capacity of the lungs is going to be decreased because remember, there is destruction of the alveoli. If you have destruction of the tissue, if you have less membrane available for exchange, of course, the diffusing capacity of the lungs are going to be decreased. So once you have, for example, that someone has an obstructive pattern, you do this test, the LCO to determine, is this asthma, is this emphysema? If the DLCO is normal, well, this can be asthma. Or th this can be chronic bronchitis. If it's decreased, well, this is emphysema. In the case that you have a restrictive pattern in this pulmonary function test, well, you do the DLCO to see what disease they have. The DLCO will be decreased in intrinsic disease of the lung. The lung tissue is affected, for example, by fibrosis. If the DLCO is normal, well, you suspect that now the lung tissue is normal, the problem is outside of, uh, outside of the lungs, in the chest wall, any neuromuscular problem, any chest wall condition, scoliosis, or rib fracture, or something that produces a restriction to the respiration. The residual volume, well, it is increased when there is air entrapment, as in obstructive disease, and it's decreased as all of the volumes and capacities are decreased in the restrictive pattern. And the vital capacity is decreased in both. Decreased. Okay? It's decreased in both cases. Okay, so a table for you to compare the two patterns, obstructive and restrictive. And there you have some causes of obstructive and restrictive lung diseases. Of course, we are not going to study all of them in pulmonology because there are many to study in the future. Okay, we already studied this. Yeah. This produces obstructive pattern. We are going to study asthma. We are going to study bronchiectasis, bronchiolitis, COPD, cystic fibrosis. Okay, then we have many that produce restrictive disease. Some of them are going to be studied in musculoskeletal <coughs> system, rheumatology, because they have to do more with the musculoskeletal system. In nervous system, we are going to study some others. For example, ankylosing spondylitis is going to be studied in rheumatology. These are going to be studied in pharmacology. No? Amiodarone, methotrexate, nitrofurantoin, they can produce a restrictive pattern as an adverse reaction. Here we are going to study interstitial lung diseases, like for example, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis. Okay, we are going to study some other interstitial lung diseases like pulmonary fibrosis, okay, and some others that we are going to be covering. And these are going to be studied in nervous system disorders. Okay, so restrictive patterns or restrictive diseases are going to be studied in different sections. This is just an overview that has kind of a mnemonic there. Overview of the restricted lung diseases or restrictive lung diseases. Okay, normally they are characterized by a reduced lung volume. All of the volumes and capacities are reduced and can be due to pleural, alveolar, interstitial, neuromuscular, and thoracic cage. You can use the word pain to remember. Paint, P A I N T, to remember. What happens in these conditions is that there is a decreased compliance 
People require more effort to expand the lungs, so they have an increased work of breathing. They will have an increased respiratory rate, dyspnea, decreased volumes, decreased all capacities and forced vital capacity. Remember, the ratio is normal or increased. And the ones that we are gonna be studying are aspiration, aspiration of fluids, aspiration of foreign bodies, atelectasis, which is simply a collapse of the lung tissue, pulmonary fibrosis, inhalation disorders. For example, we are gonna be studying pneumoconiosis, allergic alveolitis, pulmonary edema, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, in all cases of these diseases, there is gonna happen what is called a ventilation perfusion mismatch that will affect the uh, capacity of the alveolocapillary membrane to exchange oxygen, and the final result in any case will be hypoxemia. There you have a link that I recommend you to read about what is a ventilation perfusion ratio and mismatch. The most important part of this is the one that says changing the ventilation perfusion ratio pathologically. Okay, in order to understand what happens and the steps taken by the body to normalize the ventilation perfusion ratio. What happens when there is a lack of ventilation? For example, a foreign body, or we simply stop breathing. If you want to stop ventilation, you stop breathing. What does the body do? What, what changes occur in the lungs to adapt? Or when there is an obstruction of one of the bronchi by any foreign body, okay? Or what happens when there is no perfusion, for example, a pulmonary embolism that blocks one of the pulmonary arteries? What happens with that section of the lungs that now has ventilation but no perfusion? Or perfusion but no ventilation? That is what we call a ventilation perfusion mismatch. Okay, read that. At least the, the, the last section would be great if you could read everything and understand everything because that explains a lot of physiologic changes, how we change the ventilation perfusion physiologically. Okay, it's not hard to read. It's just one page and gives you a lot of good information. Okay, so in any case, there's gonna be hypoxemia as the final result. We are gonna stop here, we are gonna continue in the next lecture. Thank you, guys. Thank you.